Hey folks, I'm J.B. Shreve with the Faithful Considerations podcast. Wanted to give you a little heads up on this podcast series that we're releasing right here, Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. This is a look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. Now, the only reason I, reason I wanted to put in this little uh, little bit of an intro beyond what we'll be doing in the podcast itself is to let you know we actually have a video series. This series which was originally released as a video series through YouTube. You can go to jbshreve.com and access that. So I wanted to do an audio version too for all of our podcast subscribers, our audio podcast subscribers. But I wanted to let you know that every once in a while within this podcast, I'll refer to visuals, um, maybe something that you're going to see instead of hear within the, the episode itself. And you can access that for free, jbshreve.com, the Faithful Considerations website. You should also subscribe to the YouTube channel. So I'm going to put this little intro at the forefront of every one of these episodes in the series as far as the audio version is concerned. Just want to make sure that you had it. And yeah, I think that'll do it. Let's jump into today's podcast episode, Manifesto, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. Hey folks, welcome back. I'm J.B. Shreve for the Faithful Considerations Podcast, and we are in episode three of our Manifesto of the Kingdom, Life, Politics, and Reality in the Kingdom of God. We're looking at that. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to go ahead and jump into episode three today. There's this really cool passage of scripture in Luke 24 that takes shape after the resurrection, but before the disciples were really clear about what exactly all had happened. So these guys are traveling down the road to this place called Emmaus. This is in Luke 24, like I said. They're discussing discussing all the strange things that have occurred over the last week there in Jerusalem, okay? And in the middle of their discussion, who shows up but Jesus? The only thing is they don't recognize him. Let's read this passage here. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now notice he calls him a prophet right there. A prophet. They haven't understood who he really was yet. They still don't quite get it. The chief priest and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us, They had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. When their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight, then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures up to us? Now, like I mentioned in the last episode, the people did not understand who Jesus was during his three, three-year three ministry. Before the cross and the resurrection, they, they didn't understand, understand because they placed too much of their own assumptions, too much of their, their preconceived notions onto him and onto their understanding of the Messiah. He was telling them all along. And in the end, when these two disciples realized who they were speaking with, they noted how our hearts were burning within us when he talked to us. It all came down to the heart, right? We do the same thing today when you think about it. We put all sorts of assumptions, preconceived notions, man-made beliefs and doctrines, traditions onto the words of Christ, 
and we miss out on who he really is. In the first century, many disciples thought he would go to war against the Roman Empire. He would expel the occupiers. Today, we think he's going to make America great again. It's a different twist on an age-old lie. That's just not what he's about. That's not. It never has been, really. It's always kind of frustrating to me when I see these big-name ministries and ministers expound on the return of Christ. Now, these guys will go really deep. They'll they'll talk about how to, they'll talk about it like it's a science. The return of Christ, like some kind of science, pre-trib, post-trib, kingdom dominion now, all, all these things that are really not specified in the Bible. There's a lot of room for interpretation on these issues, and yet these big names write write books. They go on TV and talk about their eschatology, their their belief about the end times, like it's a science. And the one thing we know for sure is that the big names, the ministries, when Christ came the first time, well, they totally missed it, right? They missed the point. And we can all pretend we know better. We can all pretend like them, or that we wouldn't be like them, but we wouldn't dare do that, right? We wouldn't miss them. That That's what human nature does, right? It always assumes that we'll be different. But I think This is a warning to us, and it should be a louder warning than most of us realize. Those who should have known better the first time Jesus came, they missed him. They missed it so bad that they even lined up against him. It wasn't about making Judea great again. It wasn't about rebuilding temples or conquering Rome. And it's not going to be about that when he returns either. The New Testament is really, really clear on this. The way we see him, the way we recognize his kingdom, It goes all the way back to what the followers on the road to Emmaus realized. Didn't our hearts burn within us when he talked to us, right? It's all about the heart. In Matthew 4, right after the baptism by John the Baptist, right after he goes into the wilderness, Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted, right after John the Baptist is arrested and thrown into prison, we find this is the starting point for Jesus's ministry. John goes to prison and Jesus begins his work. And it says right there, Matthew 4, 17, and I'm reading from the Phillips translation here. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, you must change your hearts and mind for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. The revolution has arrived. Now's the time. Yeah, you don't have to take up arms. You don't have to enter into a a resistance organization or any kind of civil disobedience. That's not the point. What do you have to do? You have to change your heart. You have to change your minds. That's the point. In the King James Version of the Bible, the word heart is mentioned 44 times in the Gospels. Now, just for comparison's sake, the word law, only 31 times in all of these same books of the Bible. Over and over again, Jesus is emphasizing his revolution, the coming of the kingdom of God. It's not about some run-of-the-mill political revolution. He's not going to merely change Jerusalem. He's not merely going to change Judea or the Mediterranean region or even just the world. He's going to up in and reboot the entire system of life and death, the entire order of humanity. And he's going to do that by accessing the heart of human beings and changing the way they operate from the inside out. Here's the short story explanation of what Jesus was getting at with this revolutionary message about the kingdom of God centered upon the human heart. The story of what we call the Old Testament today, right? That's the story of God building a people. He's building a people that he could live among and be their king. You'll see that over and over again throughout the pages of the Old Testament. The idea of the kingdom of God was not a new thing when Jesus talked about it in the first century. It was the whole point of the Old Testament, in fact. When you read the Old Testament in this light, you can see it's pretty dominant, pretty obvious. When God gave the people his law, everything from the Ten Commandments to the social, the civic codes in the books of Moses, he wasn't just giving them arbitrary rules to follow. These rules, these these tenets, they represented the, the basic standards that the people would have to live by so that God could live among them and be their God, be their king. And it wasn't just for the sake of God. This wasn't just something he wanted them to do. It was for the sake of the people. The very nature of God's holy presence means his presence eliminates sin and darkness. In the book of Moses, the books of Moses, we see several occasions where God comes down upon the mountain and the people tremble in fear because his presence is so near to them. They can can sense their own near-death experience because his presence is drawing near. If he draws close to them, it's going to kill them right? Sin and darkness cannot exist. They can't coexist in his presence. The light of his holiness, the light of his righteousness, it eradicates sin and darkness. So this whole system of sacrifice, this whole system of laws that was delivered to Moses, that was built up to provide a way for the people to enter into his righteousness, into this, to do it safely, 
to come before God safely without being destroyed. The people wouldn't be destroyed, but they kept falling from the standard that he gave to them. They would violate laws. They, they failed to keep sacrifices. The, the fundamental flaw of a fallen humanity was that when they were flawed and sinful from the inside out, they couldn't, they, it just wouldn't work. They couldn't get it to work right. The ancient King David, in one of his poems, he says, I was born in sin. This is in Psalms. One of those poems, all right? I was born in sin. I was sinful at birth from the time my mother conceived me. And so the issue, as David observed, it comes down to the heart. Well, what if God himself performed the sacrifice that could cleanse the heart from sin? What if he changed the nature of the human heart? So it wasn't just about keeping rules or, or keeping laws, but it changed the very, na- the very nature of the makeup of human beings. And even if man broke the rules... The, the recreation of the human, the revolution of the human heart, well, that could change the nature of, hum, of mankind. In that same poem where David acknowledges he was conceived in sin, he recognizes the need for this. He, he forecasts, he, he's basically prophesying. He's saying, this is what I, what I need to happen. It's not just the law. It's not just the standards that I need from God. This is what I need. He says in Psalms 51, he goes, don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And make me willing to obey you. I love that psalm. I love those words from this psalm, this poem written by David. He's crying out to God, change me from the inside out. It's It's through this change, this change from the inside out, that Christ could unleash the real revolution of the kingdom of God. Oh, and by the way, remember the prophets who foretold that a Messiah, a revolutionary figure, would arise from from within the midst of the children of Israel? Well, they talked about this too. Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a, a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. At some point this year, I hope, I I need to do a devotional series at the website, jbshreve.com, on the heart. I just want to focus on the heart, what the Bible has to say about the heart, because the heart is the center of man's being. And I'm not talking about the like the pump pump physical organ of the heart, right? I'm talking about the the leb. It, that's the, one of the Hebrew words used in the Old Testament for this. It's the mind, the will, the emotions. It's the the consciousness of a man or a woman. It's the central core of a man that was made to hear and to commune with God. That's the way he created us. That's how God designed us. Sin and darkness changed all of that after the fall of mankind. But that doesn't mean the original design isn't still relevant. In the New Testament, the Greek word often used for the heart is koelia, all right? Now, sometimes that same word, koelia, it's translated as womb. In John 7, 38, when describing the nature of the kingdom reality in our lives, he uses this word, Jesus uses this word to explain how rivers of living water will flow out of our koelia, out of our heart. Proverbs tells us to guard our heart above all else because from it all of the issues of life flow. This is basic, hardcore life architecture. This is the way it works. In our modern age, we talk about the ego. We talk about the id, our our self-esteem, our basic needs for life. All of these things, none of those are the truth. That's not the way life really works. The heart is the center of our being. That's how God made us. That's how our, our design works, how our human design works. Faith and prayer, born in the heart. Even our individual will, yours and mine and yours, individual will, it's seated. It takes shape within our heart. Our personal values are born there. Our perceptions, the boundaries of those perceptions, they originate in our heart, the core of our being. The revolution of the kingdom of God, of the work of Christ, it begins in the heart. Again, the people who should have known better, they missed this during the the three years that Jesus walked among them. There's this pivotal scene in Luke 17, 
the religious leaders, they approach Jesus and they ask for clarity. They say, are you the Messiah? Are you the revolutionary that, that we've long awaited? If, if you are, then when? How? How is the kingdom of God going to come through you, right? What's the plan? What's the strategy? How are you going to oust Rome from Palestine? How are you going to take power? And Jesus responds to him. This is in Luke 17, verses 20 to 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Other translations of that same passage, they say that the kingdom of God is among you. Now, this shift in wording, it's not really that big a deal. Some people make it a big deal, but he's saying right there, this is the heart of what he's saying. He said, you don't have to look to kings and politicians. Don't look to movements and organizations. Let the power of God actively engage within you to change you from the inside out. That's what the whole point is. Don't get this confused with religion. All right. I start reading verses and talking about the law and about the heart and about sin and the tendency for, for most of us is to just kind of drift away into a stupor thinking, oh, yeah, that's religion. That's things that that's religious talk. And, and we separate that over over there away from our life, away from the reality of our life. This isn't the case. That's not a correct view of this. When Jesus talked about the heart, he was talking about a revolutionary reality. We could be made whole again. We could we could be made clean again. Created me a new heart, is what David asked. We could walk with God. We could walk in the power of the kingdom, not in some far-off lifetime in another world, but right here in the here and now. Jesus didn't say the kingdom was coming. He said it's here. It's at hand. Change your minds. Change your hearts because the kingdom of God is here. Sin and darkness, they always want us to never recognize the kingdom of God and the power of Christ, what he was saying there. If we do recognize, then darkness tries to convince us that the kingdom of God is not for the here and now. It's for tomorrow. It's for the afterlife. It's in heaven, right? But that's not what Jesus said. That's not what he said. The revolutionary reality of Christ's teaching is that we could live in the reality of the kingdom of God right now. Rather than living a lifestyle based upon, upon what our external needs and our demands are, we could live from the basis of a clean heart. And from that clean heart, we meet and talk and, and walk and live with God. And from that clean heart, life and the revolutionary reality of the kingdom of God begins to flow outward into the daily activities of our life. Sin and the law, the knowledge of right and wrong, they imprisoned mankind to this state of existence where we lived from the outside in. It was all focused on what we could or couldn't do. Well, the revolution of Christ reestablished us according to God's original design, so we could live from the inside out. That's the way God created us to live, from the inside out. That's real key. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans 8. Let me just read this here. This is from the Message Translation. It's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but this is worth it. Romans chapter 8. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a, f a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it was always by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked, asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscles, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust in God's action in them find what, that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Obsession with self-interest in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone who completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ex ignores who God is and what he's doing. And God isn't pleased at being ignored. 
But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him and whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in us, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from the dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. These are the things and places to go. I love the message translation. I mean, that's that's a totally different take on words that are just eternal right there, right? And you might be wondering, yeah, you say this isn't about religion and all of that, but still, you know, isn't it? Isn't this really just about righteousness and having a, a righteous heart? And the answer is yes, kind of. I mean, obviously, it, but it really goes beyond that. The core premise of those kind of, a, of, I guess, flippant statements and questions is a misunderstanding of what sin and disobedience really are. See, we think of the law as a list of do's and don'ts. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, things like that. That's not really what the law was all about. The law was a design for life. It was designed to keep us safe, individually, collectively, as a society. This is what a lot of people miss when they read the Bible. It's one of the ways that religion misconstrues the, the nature of the law and of righteousness. The law was meant to be a design of life that would keep people healthy, wealthy, and wise. That was the whole point. And Jesus, he came to fulfill the law. We're no longer bound to the law. But because the nature of this revolution is a, re, a rewiring of our hearts so that we are properly relating to God, it means we desire to do the things that God wants us to do. Our heart gets rewired to want to do what he wants us to do. We may not always get it right. Get it right. That's okay. All right. The perfect sacrifice that Jesus made covers all of those errors, all of those mistakes. But these rules that are written on our hearts through the form of convictions, through the form of, of enlightened knowledge of God's preferences, his values, his and his will. These aren't just about don't do this, but do, you know, go and do that. It's about the design of life that will foster fulfillment, uh, peace, safety, and strengthen our lives and the lives of our family from one generation to the next. We're supposed to be growing from strength to strength, not struggling under these burdens of sin and weakness. Now, this is really important here because it gets at the heart of what the kingdom of God and what the revolution was really all about. It's not just about me and Jesus. It's supposed to spread out from there. God heals our hearts. He redeems our hearts through Christ. But real benefits of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, they're not in the hereafter. They're not for tomorrow. They're for right now. They're for today. It's in the here and now. It's about recognizing this design of life that contrasts against the design of life offered by the world around us. This world says, seek your self-interest. That's what the world around us says. It says, be fearful. It says, uh, protect yourself. That's what the world tells us. It'll always tell us that. The kingdom of God says, go and self-sacrifice. Take up your cross. Lay down your life for others. The world says hoard power and wealth. The kingdom of God says you reap what you sow. The world says dog eat dog. It's a rat race. Survival of the fittest. Might makes right. The kingdom of God says the meek will inherit the earth. This isn't religion. This is a revolution. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. Now, in the future episodes, we're going to get into the specific manifesto of the kingdom. It's coming, I promise you. But I want, to, I want to go to one more episode before we get to the actual manifesto. And I want to talk uh, about who's in charge. Okay, we need to look at that. Before we go any further, we need to look at the government of the kingdom of God. How's it set up? How's it structured? Who, who rules? Who's in charge? Who's really there, right? That's where we're going to go in the next episode. So we'll be back real soon in the next couple of days, in fact, here at J.B. Shreve and Faithful Considerations. If you haven't already subscribed, be sure and do that so that you can be alerted when the next episode's available. Thanks for watching and listening, everyone.